Usually people clap when I leave the room, not come. <laughs> well, actually, sometimes it is. <laughs> it did happen once. <laughs> I mean, speaking of anger, <laughs> I, uh, this is totally, I wasn't intending, thanks, Jay. <laughs> but now I have to finish it. I was in college, and I played football in college, um, and the administration got the bright idea that they wanted to cancel the football program after my sophomore year. And there's all kinds of demonstrations and big meetings and stuff. And so we had this meeting with the principal, and he had the football team in there. Uh, I don't know why he met with us. He'd already decided what he was going to do. It wasn't really to talk with us. It was just to tell us the news. And, we, and he and invited us to ask any questions. We were asking these questions. And I asked a couple questions. And I was just really hacked, because it became really apparent quickly that this was just a sham, this meeting. And, and he, why did you, I said, why did you even call us in here if you already decided? <laughs> and so I just, I picked up my coat and I just, I walked out. And, and I, I, I don't, I, I was really angry, okay? And, <laughs> and so, and it wasn't necessarily righteous anger. Um, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of anybody who had set up a sham meeting like this is a complete <laughs> idiot or dishonest and talking to the president of the school. And I walked out and slung my coat across my shoulder. And I walked out of the room, and the rest of the football team stood up and applauded. So, <laughs> so it is true that sometimes people clap when I leave the room. <laughs> I, got my, I got my picture in the paper for that, and there's a reporters, and it's me just with my coat, and I'm just like walking out of the room. And the caption was, Tad Sowers, tight end, has had enough. <laughs> so anyway, I wasn't going to tell that story. Um, but I guess that leads in a little bit. I, I have been looking forward um, to talking about this. Uh, John and I have been talking about, you know, should we present it as a class of some kind? And, um, and then we thought, well, who's going to sign up for a class? Yeah, I need a class on anger. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's good that we do it on Wednesday night. But I, it's, a, it's something that I really want to talk about because I, a lot of you that, that know me, I... Um, I don't think I probably generally appear to be a real angry guy, but there was a time in my life where I really was an angry guy. And it wasn't just when I was bef before I was a Christian, because that little story I just told you, I was a Christian in college. Um, but I still, I would, I would just get angry sometimes. Um, and I've got scars on my body. I have a two and a half inch scar from there to there from anger. Um, I've got, uh, <laughs> oh man, I've made so many of the, Females in my life cry because of anger. I do go back and apologize, but you know the the damage has been done. And over the years, as a father, I just had to really develop that and just learn. And that's one of the main things God used in my life, actually, is to just break that of me, is to um, the love I had for my girls, and and I would just say things in angry tones, and um, didn't didn't like that, didn't like it at all. And uh, and and he has he has done a, a lot of, of changing. And, and, I, and I know a lot of us struggle with this. We, we, we do. In fact, some of us struggle with it and we don't even know it. <laughs> or maybe you do. Maybe you're... <laughs> I've told this story before um, where uh, we're all sitting around dinner. This was when the kids were... Betsy was probably about 11. David was about 9. Joanna would have been about 7. Allie would have been about 5. Somewhere in there. And Heidi would have been 1 or 2. And we're all sitting and we're talking about something. And sometimes I get intense when I talk. And my voice just gets an intense quality to it. And that quality, when I'm talking and trying to convince you of something and not quite understanding why you see it the way you see it, Kay says that I'm yelling at her when I do that. And I'm not yelling. And she did this and she said, honey, don't get mad. Don't yell at me. And I said, I'm not mad. I'm not yelling. And I looked at Betsy, who Betsy's my, she just thinks like I do, okay? She's an ally. So I said, Betsy, am I yelling? And Betsy says, well, no, dad, you're not yelling. And then Joanna <laughs> who does not think like me at all, Joanna says, well, but dad, I think maybe you're yelling in your heart. <laughs> and that's what God was trying to deal with me with over all these years. And, and just slowly, slowly, but surely, you know, he's kind of he's gotten, it, gotten it through. But it is something um, that I, I know what it feels like, uh, and I know the damage that, that it can do. So it's, it's something I really do want to talk about. Because um, it's really, it's important. It's, it's a big deal. Um, so before I start talking, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you that your word is, it's always good and it always points us in the right direction. 
And it's just up to us to look at it and just to, to take it in. And so I just pray that we could do that tonight and in the weeks to come. I really do pray that you would speak to our hearts, not just speak to our hearts, but change our hearts and convince us by your grace the importance of cooperating with you and yielding to you in this area. Um, male, female, parent, child, husband, wife, whatever we are, um, just uh, the importance of this. Because you said it's the unity that we have and the love that we demonstrate for one another that shows people the Father sent the Son, and anger is kind of the antithesis of that. And so um, we want to be what you called us to be, your representatives here on this planet of your love and what you're like. And this is an area that keeps us from doing that. Um, and so I just pray for wisdom for me, for John when he shares, and for all of us as we hear that we could just, uh, anything that's chaff, it would just blow away, but what's good would take root in our hearts, Lord. Um, and we just come to you because you're the only one that can do that. Amen. When I was a kid, um, I was the oldest, and so when there were big jobs to be done, my parents knew who to call, me. And so I had some pretty big jobs, and I lived on Vashon Island, kind of on five acres, and it was kind of lots of woods and forests and all this stuff. And we lived on a hill, and the job I hated the most was, it was my job to keep this hill basically clear um, of blackberry brambles. I hated that job. Just out of curiosity, did anybody else's parents hate them enough to give them such a job when they were a kid? Yeah, a couple of you? Okay, yeah. I, hate, I hated that job. I still, to this day, kind of hate blackberries. <laughs> um, and uh, blackberries and sourdough. That was the other thing I had to pull. We had a big lawn down, and I had to keep all these things pulled up. The sourdough wasn't so bad, but the blackberries, man, oh man, they're just tough. And I tried all these different ways to get rid of them. I had this really cool serrated uh, teeth rake thing that, I, whoosh, and that was the most satisfying. Um, but it didn't really work that well because you'd cut them and they would just grow back. And uh, and my dad told me the only way to get rid of them is you got to pull them up by the roots. You cannot cut them. You got to pull them up by the roots. That is the only way. Are you looking at me? That is the only way. And I would try everything. I would try all these other ways. I tried to poison them once. Um, that kind of got me in trouble because I poison some other things I wasn't supposed to poison. But the blackberries came back. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying, uh, one boy, one brain, two boys, half a brain, three boys, no brain at all. Any, anybody ever heard that saying? Well, it's true. Uh, my brother, as my brother got older, he helped me with this job. I say helped with air quotes. Um, and uh, there was a friend that lived down the beach that was between my brother and I. We were two years apart, and this friend was right between us. And so he would come sometimes. And the three of us were doing these blackberries one day. And I don't remember whose idea it was. It might have been mine, but I doubt it. <laughs> it was probably my brother. He was full of labor-saving device ideas. And he came up with the idea, you know, we're really just wasting our time here. Why don't we just go get one of Dad's five-gallon cans of gas and just spread it all over the blackberries? Blackberries be gone. And so we just thought about this with our three boys' minds, which means no mind, and we thought, how cool would that be? And I should also mention this is the month of August. It was at the end of the summer. Um, and so you can see where this is going. So we did. We, went, we didn't get one gallon, five gallon can of gas. We got two or three. <laughs> and, um, and we just threw it all over the place on these blackberries. We just thought, this is going to be great. And so we... Uh, we lit it, it's surprising how quickly it erupted into flame, <laughs> almost singeing our eyebrows. And we just jumped back and just beheld the beauty of the blackberries just <laughs> going up in flames. And the flames kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the blackberry patch that we were working on pretty soon, the blackberry patch was all burnt up. And we were like, this is great. Only actually it wasn't great because there were other things that started to become that were being burned now. <laughs> And what we had done, um, the blackberries were covering a bunch of stuff and just dead wood, and that had all lit. And so now we had a real fire on our hands. And the problem when you're clearing a hillside and you have a fire is the hillside goes up <laughs> and fire goes up. And we just, and the fire started to go up and we were just like, oh my gosh, now what do we do? Um, and we just kind of freaked out. We didn't know what to do. I ran down to get the hose only to, as I was down there actually grabbing the hose, I realized, wait a minute, there's no faucet that the hose will reach to from that far. So I hooked up in the faucet way down low and I'm like, got the nozzle and I'm trying to get the nozzle to reach up the hill and it's not quite reaching up the hill. It's putting out the bottom of the fire, but that wasn't the part that was burning. And so we finally, we got shovels and stuff and we ran up, we got ahead of the fire and we started 
trying to make a fire line, you know, and just clearing stuff away and throwing stuff back. And we finally just, we miraculously, we stopped it. And it finally just kind of burned itself out, I think, because things were too green to burn very well. But so we finally got the fire stopped. <laughs> and then we just looked at the hill, and there's this black, huge scar <laughs> on the hill. And we just looked at each other. How are we going to explain this to the old man? <laughs> And I actually don't even remember what he said. I just remember the terror of the fire. Um, anyway, why am I telling that story? Because anger is like blackberry brambles. You got to pull them out by the roots. And if you try any shortcuts and you don't pull them out, pull it out by the roots, it's probably going to wind up in disaster. That's why I'm telling that story. Um, we can try until the cows come home. Uh, you know, that person that makes you mad, you can try to be more patient. You can try to stop yelling at your kids. It's, it's not enough. It's not enough to just sh sheer effort and sheer brilliance of our ideas. We've got to pull it out by the roots. That's what scripture always says. Always, always. Whatever comes out of us that's impure, it's coming from our heart. It's always an issue of the heart. And, and I've got to deal with it in the heart. And boy, I'll tell you, it's surprising how many times in the Bible anger comes up. It comes up a lot. And here's the thing. A lot of it's good. A lot of, a lot of the anger is good. Um, there's, good, there's good examples of anger. Uh, Jesus in the temple, okay? That, uh, that's good, righteous anger. God's anger. God, it's constantly talking about God's anger. Um, so it's not like anger is intrinsically evil. But there's some bad anger in the Bible, too. And it's pretty much almost every time somebody not named Jesus gets mad. Um, almost every time it's, it's bad for a variety of reasons, but the reasons kind of circle around some common themes. Um, but the cool thing, as always, about the word, it doesn't just point out the problem. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of examples, and Paul even said, you know, these examples are there so that we can learn. Um, but it points out the problem, but it also brings hope, and it brings the solution to the problem. And so we're going to take, you know, several weeks to, to look at that. Um, we know that this is true of, of the word. All scripture is God-breathed, right? We, we know that. And it's useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for correcting. It's useful for training in righteousness. Um, and so as we look at what the scripture says, it's not just saying, here's a problem, you guys. It, it, it points us to the solution, um, to what that problem is. You know, Peter says his power has given everything we need, given us everything we need for life and godliness um, through our knowledge of him. Who called us? How do we get the knowledge? Right here, right here in, in this word. So for the next couple months, here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, first, we're going to look tonight. We're, I'm going to just take an overview of uh, some biblical teaching on anger and some examples of anger. And I'm going to talk about what I think is a helpful definition for anger. It's, at least it's helped me. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. So that's, that's this week. And then um, the second thing, we're going to look at how to distinguish righteous anger from sinful anger, because um, sometimes we have a tendency to think that our anger is righteous, uh, and it's usually not. Almost never is, in fact. I, I, in fact, I, I don't know if I've ever... I don't even know if this is righteous anger. There was a time when... I've probably told this story before. I'm driving along in the van. Uh, I don't even know if this was righteous anger, but it gave me a taste for maybe what God's anger might be like sometimes. I'm driving in the van. The kids are in the back. Kay's here. Uh, Joanna and Allie are in car seats. Allie's like one. Joanna's like three. Um, I'm driving along, and there's this scream from the back of the van. And how many of you are parents? Okay, most, a lot of you. Okay, good. So you know there's different screams, right? There's a scream of rage. There's the scream of terror. And there's the scream of pain. Um, this was a combination of terror and pain, uh, and it was, it got my attention. And I'm driving down the road, fortunately just two-lane road, and I'm like, what the heck? And so I look back, I can't really see anything, so I, tr I, I turn the, I'm, I'm getting the van off the road, and I'm, and I'm trying to look back, and I finally get it off, and I hit the brakes, and I look back, and here's Joanna writhing in her car seat, screaming her lungs out, and I look, and it's summer, everything bad happened in the summer to me, and... And she's, she's got those little shorts on, you know, that, that kids wear. Little, um, and I'm looking, and she's writhing. And on her leg, crawling around in her leg, there's one of those inch-and-a-half-long black-and-white hornets. Not the yellow jackets that are little, the big, huge black-and-white guys. And he's just crawling, and he's angry. I can tell the stinger's up. And, he's, and I was filled with a rage the like of which I've never known in my life. I just, something came over me, and I don't know... I, I, I reached back and I just smacked her leg 
but not smacked it to kill it. I smacked it to grab it. I didn't want it to sting her. And so I, I, I grabbed it really hard with my hand like that. Left a mark on her leg, actually. But I got it in my hand, and I just crushed it in my hand. And it stung me in the process. But I didn't even feel it until like five minutes later. I was so angry at this thing that was hurting my beloved. <laughs> and I just... That's the closest I've probably ever come, the only time I've ever come, maybe, to the wrath that God had against sin because it was destroying his beloved, you and I. And that's, that's about it as, my, as far as my throwing my hat in the ring forever having righteous anger. That's as close as I've probably ever come. <coughs> I hate hornets to this day. If you ever have any at your house, call me. I'll come and gladly kill them. Um, I will. I hate hornets. <laughs> I just hate them. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the next thing we're going to do, the, the third week, we're going to look at the roots of anger um, and, and see that its real cause does not lie in my situation or in the people around me. The cause of anger lies in my beliefs and my motives. Again, the heart. That's where the cause is. And if I'm going to fix it, if I'm going to pull it out, that's what I have to deal with. Um, talk about practical ways to pull it out by the roots uh, to, to uproot our, our anger. We're going to talk about that. Um, look at strategies uh, for dealing with anger that is revealed to others, but also anger that we don't reveal to others, that we just kind of keep inside. And eventually it winds up hurting others, but we don't show it. Um, so we're going to talk about um, just how to, how to deal with that. Uh, talk about the problem of anger against God, um, which I think a lot of people you know, struggle with sometimes. Uh, we'll also talk about anger I may have against myself which oftentimes is diag misdiagnosed as the need to forgive myself. Um, uh, I think that's the week that I'll talk, so my sarcastic self will probably come out in that one. Um, and then we're going to talk about the motivation uh, for change um, based on God's warnings and God's promises. So that's kind of a, a roadmap of, of where we're going. Okay, so what is anger? Uh, like I said, pretty universal problem. I don't think really any of us are probably immune. Um, I would guess that virtually, if not all of us, have suffered the effects of anger. Um, maybe when we became angry at other people or maybe when other people became angry at us. It's pretty, pretty universal. Um, in fact, a lot of times those two things happen together. Um, scripture talks about anger all the time. Not just God's anger, but it warns us against our anger, that, that it is full of, of warnings. Ephesians chapter 4, great chapter for just practical warnings against things. Um, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. We, <laughs> we, f we, pro we fight it almost daily. I mean, some people fight it more than others. Some people just have a more go-of-the-flow personality, but it's, it's there. Um, I'm going to read a little thing from this book. By the way, a, a, most of what we say, a lot of the stuff comes from this book called Uprooting Anger. Um, this is, uh, had I done a class, it would have been based pretty much on this book. I recommend it if you want to get it and read it. Um, I like to read things. I get way more out of reading than I do listening to somebody stand up here and talk. Um, but that's just me. Um, but throughout the book, there's some examples um, dealing with this couple, Jack and Jill. And so I'm just going to read this little introduction he has to Jack and Jill, because it'll come up in the weeks to come. Jack and Jill will be mentioned, at least by me, in the weeks to come. Um, it's just a couple paragraphs. Uh, well, I lied. It's like three or four paragraphs. Jack became a Christian at age 17 and met Jill when he was 24. In their 11 years of marriage, God has blessed them with steady employment, a comfortable home, and two healthy children. Ha, <laughs> two. <laughs> in many ways... <laughs> So apparently they've just begun, their family. Um, in many ways, they're living the American middle-class dream. They're active members of their local church and serve Christ each week as Sunday school teachers. Yet, beneath this veneer of success lurks long-standing relational dynamics of anger. A high achiever and hard worker, Jack drives himself and his family to perform up to his standards. Huh. And when he doesn't get the results he wants, Jill's affection, his supervisor's approval, his daughter's obedience, Jack explodes. <laughs> you said this picture of Jack exploding. <laughs> uh, Jill, too, has an anger problem, although she rarely erupts. In inside, she resents Jack for the demands he places on her and their daughters. At times, she even feels betrayed by God. Why did you let me marry him? She murmurs to God. I never knew it would turn out like this. She resonates with that frustrated wife who once quipped, when I married, I was looking for a great deal, but instead I found it to be an ordeal, and now I want a new deal. 
Do you see the dynamic? Can you relate to it? Jill reacts to Jack's blow-ups by withdrawing. Jack reacts to her withdrawing by blowing up. I mean, is this... A, a lot of you are probably thinking, ding, 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 ding. That's what our house looks like. Jack reacts to her... I already read that. They feed each other's anger, and to extend the metaphor, they willingly digest it and reply in kind. Both attack and defend. Both retreat and wallow. Both feel justified. Meanwhile, their relational gulf widens. Their children inhale their secondhand smoke, and God is dishonored. And, you know, I just, uh, I feel like that, sadly, is the story in a lot of our homes. Um, and it ought not be. Jesus should make a difference, and he does make a difference. Um, so, what is anger? I want to give you uh, this working definition that this guy in the book suggests. Um, and like I say, I, I find it kind of helpful. So, so here it is. Our anger is, it'll come up there in a minute, our, our whole personed active response, I'm going to break this down, so don't worry, our whole personed active response of negative moral judgment against perceived evil. Now, I think that's a pretty good definition, actually. I think that's a, a pretty darn good definition. Um, now, there's a lot of key ideas in it, obviously, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So, number one, it's an active response. It's a whole person to active response. It's, it's an action. Anger, and, and this, this seems obvious, but it's not to a lot of us. And, and I would put myself in this category. I used to think of anger as something that I, I had. You know, anger is something that wells up within me. Um, but it's not. It's something I do. It's, it, it's not something I have. It's something I do. It's an active response. It's an action. It's not uh, some sort of a powerful monster that you know, overcomes me against my will. It's something I do, like anything in my life. I, I mean, unless I'm you know, completely stoned out of my mind on drugs or something. It's something that I completely decide to do. Um, and so what does that mean? That means I'm responsible for it. It's not some monster. You know, you remember that... Well, if you're not my age, you probably don't. Flip Wilson, everybody know who that is? The devil made me do it. Yeah, I mean, that was very funny, except for it's not funny, because a lot of people, I think we think that way, that something else made me do it. So it's an active response, and it, it comes from me. It's a whole personed response. In other words, it's not, it's not, just, uh, it's not just an emotion. Um, it's not just... Uh, you know, an act of the will or just based on a belief. It's not just a, here's the main one, it's not just a reaction that just flares up. You know, it's just a little thing that just, little flame that flared up in my life. It's complicated. It involves my whole person. It does involve my beliefs, what I believe. Yeah, but that's not all. It does involve my emotions and my, my feelings. Yeah, it, it is, but, it, but that's not all. It involves my actions, what I decide to do. Yeah, but that's not all. It involves my desires, things that I want. Yeah, but that's not all. It's the whole complicated, stinky package that just kind of is all wrapped up into this thing that we call anger. So it's a, it's, maybe what I'm saying is it's a bigger deal than we think. It's not just something that <clears throat> flares up and then it disappears. And a lot of times we think of it as that, and, and it's not. Um, it's a, the third thing is it's a response against something. It doesn't come... Um, it, it, it doesn't come out of a vacuum. It's a reaction or a response against some provocation, something that happens, a person or an event that happens. Um, now, I'm not saying that that event or that person is the cause of it. Uh, that, that's, that's a different thing. I, I can't say, um, you know, she made me angry or he makes me angry or I was angry because my car exploded, you know. <laughs> Funny, I should think of that example with my cars. Um, uh, I, I can't, I can't say that it's not a causative thing, but there is a provocation. It's, but the thing is, its cause is in my heart. But it's my heart, my very active heart, that's responding to these people and to these events in my life. They're not causing it; they're, they're um, triggering it. I, I guess maybe to say, um, there's a. Uh, I think I was going to tell this example later, but I'm just going to do it now. Let's just say that, um, well, this isn't a nice new white rug, but, but you know, let's say you, uh, you know, you're, you're in somebody's house and they just put a new carpet in, this beautiful cream-colored carpet, okay, just like, it's just beautiful. And you're just talking about how wonderful it is. And while you're talking there, you're sitting there holding a mug of coffee. Well, that's your first mistake right there. But mistakes tend to compound. 
And so you're holding a mug of coffee, and it's a, it's a party, housewarming party, and then somebody comes along and carelessly just boom, bumps your arm, and pfft, coffee goes all over their nice new light, light cream-colored rug, and it's coffee. So it's pretty bad. It's going to make a stain, because they're too cheap to have bought the stain guard. So, um, you know, the, I think for most of us, the, the, our first reaction is to look at the person and go, oh, look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. You bumped my arm. And so the question is, why did I spill coffee all over the rug? Was it because they bumped my arm? Well, no. I spilled coffee all over the rug because I had coffee in the mug. If I would have been drinking something good, like water, instead of coffee, <laughs> I would have spilled water on the rug, okay? And there would have been no problem. But I didn't have water in the mug. I had coffee. So it's disastrous, okay? Just replace coffee with anger and replace smug with your heart, all right? People come along and they bump your heart, and anger comes out. It's not their fault. Anger came out because you had anger in the heart. That's why it came out, not because they caused it. They were the catalyst, but it came from your heart, just like the coffee, coffee came from your decision to fill it up with that vile substance in the first place, and that's why it spilled all over. So, coffee is useful, for examples, um, so. Um, there's, a, there's a story of a little girl, and she's, uh, she's showing her friend the, um, wow, I am really going too slow. <laughs> she's showing her friend the bathroom scale, um, and uh, with, you know, they're little, little kids, and, and, and she says, I don't really know what it is, but my mom and my dad use it every single day. All I know is when you stand on it, it makes you really mad. <laughs> It's not the scale that makes them mad. That's like saying, does this dress make me look fat? It's just, it's, it's within us, all right? It's not, it's not the thing. Okay, so it's a response against something, but that something isn't the cause. Um, it's a negative moral judgment. Uh, what anger does, essentially it's saying, that was wrong. You were wrong. That's unjust. That's not, that's not fair. This has to stop. It's, it's not negative in the sense that it's sinful. I, I'm, that, that, that's, that's not my point. It's negative because it opposes something. It's against something. It opposes a, a perceived evil, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, it sets us against the situation that we're seeing. It, is, it sets us against the person. So in that sense, it's a negative, um, it's a negative moral judgment. Where it sets us against that thing as being immoral or unjust, unfair, or something like that. Um, and, and, and I'm, not just making, I'm not just being dramatic. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, right? He said, if you're angry with your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. So I, I'm, not, I'm not blowing this out of proportion. I mean, this is consistent with what our, our Lord said. And then the last thing, it's a negative moral judgment against a perceived evil. So, and this is where a lot of times the problem comes. This negative moral judgment that um, I issue against this perceived evil, it comes out of my personal perception, Right? It's a perceived evil, notice. It doesn't say an actual evil. It might be an actual evil, but it might not. It's a perceived evil, and my perceptions might be right, or they might be wrong. And a lot of times they're wrong. Um, I mean, how many times, you don't have to say, but how many times have you misjudged, misperceived somebody else's motives? I would count mine in the hundreds, where I've misjudged people's motives. Um, how many times have other people misjudged your motives? Um, Again, many, many times. And so uh, why would we trust our perceptions and just immediately jump to anger? Um, so that's, I think, helpful for me, um, this idea of it's a whole person active response of negative moral judgment against a perceived evil of, of some kind. What that does is it lets me kind of cut through some of the um, smoke screens, I think, that we a lot of times use to try to deal with or try to justify or minimize our anger. Um, there's all kinds of them. My, my favorite one that I use, or used, still do, <laughs> on a, I don't use it on a regular basis, but I, I, I have used this hundreds of times, is I say, I'm not angry. I'm, I'm just frustrated. Okay, <laughs> what's the difference? Uh, they both, they both this, this definition covers them both. My frustration is a whole person active response of negative moral judgment against a perceived evil. You have somehow gotten in my way, and that's evil, <laughs> and I'm judging you for it. I'm not angrily yelling at you and throwing things at you. I'm just frustrated, but <laughs> call it what you will. It's the same thing, all right? So these semantic games just aren't, aren't very helpful. Use whatever word you want. The bottom line is I'm reacting to some unfairness that I perceive you wrongly have done to me. Um, 
This definition, it, it's real similar to how the Puritans described anger centuries ago. I love the Puritans. I love reading them. I just think they're pretty cool. Um, Richard Baxter wrote this. Anger is the rising up of the heart in passionate displacency. I love that. Passionate displacency. Displacency just means dislike. Uh, passionate dislike against an apprehended evil which would cross or hinder us of some desired good. I mean, that, he pretty much nails it there too. He had same key things. He, the key parts of his definition, anger comes from within the heart, all right? It's a, it's a rising up of the heart in passionate displacency. Um, it's, uh, it, it includes a negative emotional response, a passionate displacency. I love that. Um, it opposes evil as we perceive it, an apprehended evil. I apprehend that as being evil. Um, and it's evil. Why? Because it interferes with something I want. <laughs> uh, it would cross or hinder us of some desired good. So very similar, very similar definition. Um, hits all the high points, or I should say low points, probably. Um, so... Um, I look in the Bible and I see, I, I would say, when the Bible talks about anger, there's three basic kinds of anger that I see the Bible talking about. Um, divine anger, uh, human anger that's righteous, and human anger that's sinful. That's, that's how I'm lumping them together. Divine anger is actually the most common in Scripture uh, by a pretty good margin. Hundreds of references, um, New Testament and Old. You, you could say uh, and be truthful that God is the most loving person that you know. He's also the angriest person that you know. Um, in a sense. Now, now that sounds really weird to say that, right? But it's because his anger isn't like our anger. <laughs> it's different. Um, he, he is righteous. His anger is a whole person active response of negative moral judgment against perceived evil. But the thing is, it's always actual evil with him. It's real evil. It's not, it's not just that he's making a mistake. It's actual evil. It's the hornet threatening to destroy my beloved. It's, it's that thing. He's angry against sin, things that are actually evil. Um, that's where his anger is directed. Um, the, the guy that wrote the book, he, he, I just like this line. He says, God's anger is his perfect, pure, settled opposition to evil. It is his holy abhorrence to everything that violates his character or misses his will. Um, our anger tends to not be that way. Our anger is a lot more like a guy named Frank Leahy, who you probably never heard his name. Um, he was a football coach. <laughs> uh, you probably heard of Newt Rockney, famous football coach at Notre Dame years ago, really famous coach. Well, he had a, Leahy was one of the coaches that came after Rockney at, at Notre Dame. And there's this true story, apparently, of, um, I'm sure it's true because it's not a huge deal, but it just shows what our anger is, is like. I just thought it was funny. Where uh, during a game, it was a real tight game, and the center, during an extra point, the center had a bad snap. And they, and they screwed up the extra point, and they missed the extra point. And so it kept them from tying the game. And so they all run back, you know, after the bad play, they all run back. And Lee, he runs over to the center, and he grabs him. He just grabs him by the face mask, and he looks in his eyes, and he shouts, you're going to go to, you're going to burn in hell for that. You know, <laughs> that's his own player. He said, you're going to burn in hell for that. <laughs> and I just, I mean, it's such an overreaction. <laughs> and, but that's what we do. That's what we do. I, I, I know that's what I've done, and I'm pretty darn sure it's what you've done from time to time. Um, so, uh, divine anger is not like that. Then you have, you have righteous human anger, and of course we see this in Jesus, right? He was man, he was God, but he was also man. Um, he's in the temple, he's thrown out the, the money changers, um, because they turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves, and he's genuinely angry, okay? He's turning over tables, he's got this little whip thing that he's whacking at guys with. Get out of here, you thieves. Um, and, but he's angry, not because of somebody crossing him. It's because you've, my father's house is a house of prayer. It was an offense against God. Um, and, and, and it was also taking advantage of the people uh, as, as well. And that kind of anger, sadly, it's pretty rare. At least it's pretty rare in my life. Um, uh, our anger is, is only righteous when it's directed at evil that we accurately perceive as being actual evil. Now, is it, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that's not what we typically do. Um, it's violating God's character and his will instead of something that goes against my desires. That's where it's tough. And, and here where it's where it gets really tough. We, we, we're pretty smart. Um, we're so smart sometimes we outsmart ourselves. And, and we can say, oh, this is righteous anger. You know, my, my husband is, doesn't love me. My husband treats me like dirt. He doesn't love me. There's no way you could define what he does to me as love. And you know what? You're absolutely right. And so you get all angry about that. Is it evil the way he treats you? Well, yeah. But here's the thing. So, so you can say, well, that's righteous anger. 
But who does God tell to love you? He tells your husband to love you. Does he tell you to make sure your husband loves you? <laughs> he, he doesn't. It's kind of none of your business, and so you're sticking your nose in it. Or a husband whose wife isn't you know, honoring him and respecting him. You're kind of sticking your nose in somebody else's mail and their business. And so is it really righteous anger? Or is it just, it happens that an offense against you also happens to be something that God wouldn't want, but he didn't address that problem to you to solve. Um, so we just, we have to be careful we don't get them mixed up. Okay, uh, the last one, all too common, sinful human anger. This is the vast majority of anger um, that we see in the Bible, um, as well as in our own lives. It's, uh, <laughs> it's sinful. And there's a lot of ways that our anger goes wrong. Um, reading from this book again. Do you remember our definition? Anger is our whole person to active response of negative moral judgment against perceived evil. This approach helps us pinpoint the specific ways where, in which our anger might be sinful. For example, in some cases, our perceptions are wrong. They're just wrong. We're blind to what is truly sinful. Deceitful lies or self-centered lusts rule us. Perhaps ignorance or impulsiveness twists our perspectives. Our judgments are askew. We impugn other people's motives. I've already mentioned most of these things. In other cases, our responses are ungodly. You know, maybe it is a, a legitimate reason to be angry, but the way we respond is ungodly. Uh, our responses violate God's will and their form, their degree, or their timing. And well, he's going to look at that in you know, a couple chapters, and we'll get to that in a couple weeks. Um, there's all kinds of examples. Um, I'm not going to name all of them, just a few. Um, the first one, I guess, that we see is Cain. Um, that's probably the first one he... He wanted God to accept his sacrifice. Is that bad? No, that's not a bad desire. But he wanted God to accept it on, his, on Cain's terms, um, apparently not on God's terms. Um, and he believed that God should do so. And that's where he started to go wrong in believing that he kind of had one over on God, that God should go along and play ball his way. And so what he believed about God, what he should and shouldn't do, was completely screwed up. It just, it, it just was. Um, and this is how anger starts a lot of times, is our perceptions of reality just aren't right. We think that something should be a certain way. And it's, you know, what we need, here's what we need. We need a Jiminy Cricket sitting on our shoulder to say, really, why do you think that? <laughs> Explain that to me. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. A lot of our assumptions about what should be, they don't make sense, just like Keynes didn't make sense. Um, and what we do is we will do whatever we can to make that happen, even if it means sinning. And John's talked about that, you know, in the, in the prior weeks. That's how idols get going in our, in our lives, and that's how anger starts. Um, because of um, what we want, our lusts, and the lies we believe. Our lusts and our lies. I call it the deadly dynamic duo of destruction. <laughs> I made that up. Um, I thought about making a few more Ds, but it was just a waste of time. Um, Esau, same kind of thing. You know, Esau... Obviously, he didn't care much about his birthright at one point because he gave it to Jacob for a bunch of stew. Um, but then when he saw what the results were, it's like he wanted that birthright uh, and that blessing back. Um, and he believed that he was justified in his anger against Jacob to the point where he plotted to murder Jacob, um, thinking totally that he was justified um, in, in doing it. Um, one that I want to look at maybe in a little more detail is, is uh, Ahab, um, King Ahab. And you remember the story, 1 Kings 21. Uh, he wanted Naboth, this guy, to sell him some nice property at a vineyard. Um, and it was right next to the palace. And he offered Naboth money. And, and I, I think the scripture even says he offered him quite a bit of money. I think it was a pretty fair price, if I remember right. Um, but Naboth wouldn't sell it. Didn't want to sell it. It was his family's land. And the law actually didn't really let Na uh, Naboth sell it. He was supposed to keep the land in the family. So, so Ahab couldn't get him to sell. Um, and so it's, the scripture says he became very angry because he couldn't control what Naboth did. He couldn't make Naboth do what he wanted Naboth to do. And so he got really angry. Um, and Ahab was used to controlling other people. He was the king. Um, and so he expressed his anger by going home and basically turning his face to the wall and pouting. And then his wife Jezebel comes in and she finds out about it and she gets mad and she expresses her anger in a much different way. <laughs> she goes out and recruits a false kangaroo court and gets Naboth killed and assumes, you know, just does a, a fake trial and, and has Naboth killed, and then she just takes his land. Um, so what, what, was, what was the problem here? I mean, you could say it was selfishness, but what got Ahab into trouble, I, I think, was he just assumed that Naboth should have done what he wanted him to do because he was the king. I should be able to control people because I'm the king. Um, 
what he believed was wrong about people, other people, about himself. Um, and here's the thing, because of that, he couldn't leave it in God's hands. He, he, he didn't see, uh, he didn't believe that God was trustworthy enough to do this thing. He preferred to do it himself. Um, and how many times, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I have gotten angry, it's because of this control thing. Things should go a certain way. I've thought about it. It's the best way. You're an idiot if you disagree with me. And you, I'm going to do what I have to do to kind of push you into my way of thinking. It's good for you in the long run. I mean, that's kind of how I approach uh, things. That's, that's my natural bent um, in, in approaching things. And, uh, you know, what examples closer to home, maybe this has happened to you today, this week, and if it has, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, at work, there's a promotion. You deserve the promotion. Um, at work, you work longer, you work harder than, than the other people. You actually do. Your performance speaks for itself, but you don't get the promotion. And you don't even really get a decent explanation why you didn't get the promotion. It goes to somebody else. And any idiot can see that they're less qualified than you are. Um, now, that could be, assuming that you're right, that could be a, a reasonable cause, I guess, for anger. You've been done wrong. The company didn't follow its own policies. Um, okay, you, you, you could get angry about that, or maybe your perception of it isn't quite right. Or maybe your perception is right, and there's, there's a whole other option of, available to you. Does God call you to get angry in that situation? No, he doesn't. Um, maybe it's a reason to look up to heaven and say, Father, I know promotion comes from you, <laughs> not from man. The uh, Bible talks about that. Um, I know you always have my best interests in mind. I know you're always working in my life. So maybe be like Jesus, I commit my spirit into your hands instead of into my hands trying to control things. And man, if we could just do that, especially, no, it's not true. I was going to say especially guys, but it's both. Um, just that, that would save us a, a bunch of hassle just to have faith in the Lord that he's actually the one that's in control of our life and we don't have to control people or, or things. Um, I am so not going fast enough, so I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, uh, let's see. I'm just going to jump to Haman. Um, in the book of Esther, Haman had a different problem. I mean, he still was a control freak, but his problem, I would say, was more pride. Um, and that's a big cause of anger, too. Uh, he'd risen to this high position in the Persian kingdom, uh, favorite of the king. He'd stand in the king's gates, and everybody would bow. Nobles would bow when they passed through in the gates. But there was one guy named Mordecai, Mordecai who wouldn't do it. Um, he kind of knew what Haman was like, and he just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't bow, and he wouldn't bow. He was a Jew, and it's like, I'm not going to bow and worship anybody. So what was Haman's response? He had a bunch of responses that he could have done, other than getting angry, which he did. He could have just ignored it um, and just gone about his business. It's just one guy who really gives a rip what Mordecai thinks about me. Um, that probably would be my response, just avoid the problem. Um, uh, he could have tried to earn Mordecai's respect. Why? Why don't, won't he bow? Maybe I, you know, maybe, maybe I could work harder. Maybe he's got a point there. But no, he gets so mad that he plots <laughs> not only Mordecai's death, but the death of every Jew he could get his hands on. I mean, talk about an overreaction. That's a lot worse than the football coach. Um, the, the thing with Haman was deep down, this pride was so brittle, like pride usually is. And he was threatened by, you know, anybody not respecting him. Um, you know, he feared that if, that if, you know, he didn't do something with Mordecai, other people wouldn't respect him. I mean, you know, the, it goes on and on. But that's what pride does. And he got angry. I'm just going to be honest here. Um, guys, watch out for this. Because Scripture tells husbands and wives certain things. It tells husbands to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Um, it tells you that because that's what she needs. Uh, she needs love. She needs to know she's the apple of your eye, that she is the center of your heart's affections. Um, that's what Kay needs from me. But he doesn't tell Kay to love me as Christ loved the church. He tells Kay to honor and respect me, which is really different. It's kind of significantly different. And here's the thing, that is what I need. I don't need K. I don't need to, have to just rest in the knowledge that she just thinks I'm wonderful and she loves me and she loves me today as much as she loves me yesterday. You know, I, I need her, the thing that would yank the rug out from under me is if she started to think, you know, he's kind of an idiot. He's a moron. 
He's not trustworthy. I can't trust him with our family's well-being. I can't trust him with my well-being. He can't lead. Where she starts to doubt that I am, that, that, that I am, I, I can handle it with God, obviously, but that she doesn't have to worry. That's what I want her to think about me. I, th I, I want her to think that a lot more than I just want her to be in love with me. I know she loves me. She doesn't have to keep telling me that. But I, if she starts to not respect my ability to be the father and the husband that God's called me to be, that's where I start to lose my confidence. So here's what I'm saying. Haman reacted when Mordecai didn't give him the honor and respect. He overreacted. Because Mordecai was denying him, in a sense, what Haman needed. I mean, we know guys need this, right? What is one of the main problems at home? Why does the wife not respect and honor you a lot of times? It's because, well, you know, every time you come home, she's on your case about something. And you're, you're thinking, why are you such a shrew? <laughs> I go to work and people tell me, good job. I come home and people say, you're an idiot. What do you, you know? And, and it's like, I'm getting, I'm getting strokes at work. People are honoring me and respecting me. And I come home and nobody honors and respects me. So, of course, I never come home. I'm at work all the time. So Haman wasn't getting that, and he overreacted. He got angry to the nth degree because he wasn't getting something that he really needed. And my, my word of warning is, husbands, don't do that. Don't do that. Just because your wife, you feel like she doesn't respect you and honor you, don't react like Haman and get all angry. Because she is. She's squeezing off your lifeblood that you need. But you know what? Here's the thing. There is one who honors you. He honored you enough to die for you. And if that's not enough, I don't know what is. You got, a big, you got a bigger problem than that your wife doesn't honor you. If Jesus, if the honor and respect that Jesus showed for me by dying for me on the cross to purchase my salvation, if that's not enough for me, then I am a big blubbering crybaby, all right? I'm not very honorable. So I need to, you know, put on my big boy pants and just kind of man up here and realize I don't actually need this woman to treat me like the king that I'm not. <laughs> and so just don't overreact, okay? So I'm just being honest because I've kind of done that and I know some of you guys have done that so just watch out and don't make the mistake that Naaman makes um, uh, and then here's here's the contrast <laughs> here's the contrast to Naaman um, you, you have Jesus standing before Pilate having been unjustly accused unjustly arrested unjustly beaten unjustly tortured um, soldiers putting a robe on him, mocking him, crown of thorns, hail king of the Jews. How does he respond? Is there even a tinge of anger that he expressed in that whole ordeal? If there is, I missed it. I missed it. I, I can't find it. Um, he stands there like a lamb before the shearers, and he opens not his mouth. He offers no protest. He makes no defense. Why? He knows there's nothing they can do that's not allowed by the Father. Um, Pilate even said that. You know, Pilate says, uh, Pilate's standing looking at this guy, beat up. He's amazed. Don't you know I have power to crucify you or release you? When he's, you know, talking with the crowd and stuff. And Jesus says, you would have no power at all against me if it wasn't given you from above. That, man, that is humility. That is, that is a guy who is not going to lose his temper because somebody's not respecting him. Because <laughs> he doesn't need it. Because he knows who's running the show. It's God. And so he doesn't need that from, from people, people around him. And, and I think that's, that's the key. You got Jesus' humility and Haman's pride and what a difference there is. And that difference is just as much as the peace um, that Jesus shows and the fury and the anger Naaman shows because they have these totally different ways of understanding reality and who God is and his control in their life, who the Father is. So anyway, something to learn there uh, from, from Naaman. Um, Sometimes <coughs> our anger, not very often, but sometimes we are angry about something that is legitimately unjust. Um, Absalom, one of David's uh, sons, his favorite son, he had a sister named Tamar and a half-brother named Amnon. Amnon rapes Tamar. Um, Absalom is furious. To be honest, as I would be if I was in his shoes, I would be absolutely furious. The problem isn't so much the anger. The problem is what he did with it. The problem is what Absalom did with, with his anger. Um, he let it smolder, he didn't deal with it, he gave place to the devil. And what he did is he insisted on revenge. That's what he did. He sought revenge. Um, and, and he believed that he had the right to do that, that it was just for him to do that. And that just isn't right. And uh, Paul writes in Romans 12, he says, Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Absalom's revenge, his anger, and attempts to take revenge, it led to the murder of Amnon, but it also became, it led to this huge plot to take over the kingdom, and eventually it wound up killing who? Absalom himself. He got caught in his own trap. And so, you know, it goes back to his anger, which I don't, I can't really blame him for the anger, but he just let it eat at him, and he took it in a wrong direction. Um, and so sometimes, even if the anger itself isn't necessarily unrighteous, our response is it's out of whack. It's not, it's not the right response. Um, and when we try to make things right and seek revenge, even if it's just with our words, I mean, Absalom did a lot more than that, um, we, we rob God of something that's just his. And we do that all the time, don't we? When we fight with people, conflict that we have sometimes, we're trying to get revenge. We're trying to inflict wound for wound, you know, eye for eye. And when we're doing that, we're just forgetting what the Lord said. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I think I probably told you this before. I used to love watching those Clint Eastwood movies, the spaghetti westerns, you know. But the story was all the same all the time. In the beginning, somebody did something really bad to Clint, and he spent the rest of the movie tracking him down and making him pay. And I was like, yeah, yeah, go, Clint, yeah. Outlaw Josie Wales, yeah, you know, all this stuff. And I was watching, in fact, I think it was the Outlaw Josie Wales. <laughs> I was watching, and it just hit me. I was watching it by myself, you know, late at night, and, and it just hit me. He's just taking vengeance. And I, I think I had probably just read Romans 12, and it just, boing, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And I'm like right in the middle of a, yeah, oh, man. And I did, I, I, I had to tell the Lord, I said, I'm not going to watch those movies anymore. Because I love that kind of movie. I love it. And I still, I won't watch. There's a movie I actually really want to watch. I think I would really like it in my flesh. But I'm not going to watch it. Because it's just a guy taking revenge because guys kidnapped his daughter. And, you know, put her in the sex slave trade. And I'm not going to watch it. Good actor playing the lead role. I, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going to watch it. Because it's just revenge. Uh, I saw the trailer, so I, I know. <laughs> um, Anyway, Absalom had a lot of other choices when he got angry. Um, he could have forgiven Amnon, left the whole thing in God's hands. God's way better at that. Um, he, could have he could have invested his energy into what? Instead of killing Amnon, he could have protected his sister, which probably would have been a more loving thing to do anyway. He what? He what? And he runs out and spends the rest of his life trying to kill you know, Amnon and take over the kingdom. What happened to poor Tamar? He could have protected her. I mean, there's all kinds of things he could have done, but he just screwed it up. Um, so... Anyway, there's lots more examples. We're going to look at them in the, in the weeks to come. Um, so uh, let me um, just read a little paragraph here kind of along those lines. What do we find in all these Old Testament texts, which we'll look at more stories later? Angry people respond with their whole being, their thoughts, their emotions, their affections, their words, their actions, etc., to people they perceive to be wrong or harmful to their own interests. Those reactions are frequently hot reactions, often always with God, and sometimes with humans, that perception and the accompanying response are just and warranted. But in other cases, never with God, and usually with humans, they're not just and warranted. The resulting anger is sinful. So we look, and we're going to look, and we see real people in the scriptures getting really angry, um, forming, forming negative moral judgments against what they perceive to be evil, um, and they respond to that evil, whether it's really evil or not, in these whole person ways, in their desires, and their thoughts, their emotions, their words, their actions, their goals. And it just gets all messed up. <laughs> um, so next week, uh, what we're going to talk about next week, John, is kind of the idea of, okay, these moral judgments I'm making and the resulting action that I'm taking, these whole person responses, um, uh, you know, whether they're right or wrong, whether they're you know godly or whether they're evil, how do I tell the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger? That's what we're going to talk about next week, is how you can kind of filter through and tell the difference. It should be obvious to us, but it's not always. Um, so I'm going to leave you with just something to reflect on. Um, if uh, you can think, think about this. 
Uh, Richard Baxter's description of anger, um, that, that the last slide. Um, think, think on what that says as soon as it comes up. The rising up of the heart in passionate displacency against an apprehended evil which would cross or hinder us of some desired good. Where in that do those words define you? Um, uh, where, where, where do you get caught up in that? Where are the times where someone or something, usually it's someone doing something, would cross or hinder you of some desired good? When, when does that happen? What, uh, what tends to make you angry? Um, when was the last time you got angry? Did it fit that? Um, where, was, where did you go wrong you know, in perceiving, or as he says, apprehended evil or perceived evil? Where did you go wrong? Or is it possible that you were wrong um, in perceiving something as evil? Is there another explanation? And here's the thing, guys. So much of our conflict comes with the people we love the most, our husbands, our wives, our kids. And what does love do? Love hopes all things and believes all things. It doesn't jump to conclusions about, oh, you must have had an evil, thought, an evil motive. And, and a lot of times we perceive evil because we jump to conclusions. And we're not obeying one of the basic commands in Scripture, love. And part of love, 1 Corinthians 13, part of love is to believe and hope all things. In other words, you give people the benefit of the doubt. You can't get in their head and know. Just because I would have had a motive, a certain motive when I, if I said that, that doesn't mean my wife does. She's a much different creature than I am. And I could say something, and chances are I probably had a certain motive. She could say the same thing, and it would be the most innocent inquiry of all. Um, you know? <laughs> so why we just got to stick with the basics sometimes. It's just love. Give people a benefit of the doubt. Don't, don't rush to perceive evil. But just think about that. In, 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 that, in that definition, where, you know, when, when I find my heart rising up, what evil am I really seeing? And am I really sure that that's evil? And even if it is evil, is the, is the thing that comes out of my heart, is that the appropriate response? Or am I like, you know, am I more like Amnon, who just, or Absalom, who rushes off to kill Amnon, and here's his sister crying her eyes out because she's been raped, and he doesn't even... He just goes off to do his manly things and just make everybody pay. And well, that makes him feel better, I suppose, but it doesn't make her sister feel any better. So I don't know. Um, it's just something to think about. And I think when we reflect on things like that, the Lord usually comes through and, and speaks to us. So that is all I have to say about that tonight. And so hopefully in the weeks to come, uh, you will keep coming and reflecting on this with us and invite all the people you know that struggle with anger. But don't tell them that's why you're inviting them. <laughs> they might get angry at you. <laughs> um, so just pray. Pray that God would speak to you, know, you, obviously, but that he would just speak to all of us. Just pray that you know, John and I could do this in, a, in an edifying, good way, um, that we could be uh, you know, good uh, teachers up here, but also good sharers of our own ridiculously stupid things that we've done from time to time as well. We have a tendency sometimes to tell stories and we're the hero, you know. I purposely try to tell stories where I'm the idiot <laughs> because that's a lot more of those stories for me to pick from, for one. Um, but yeah, you know, like the time I almost burned down Vashon Island. So uh, anyway, just, uh, I just, my prayer is that God really uses this. So anyway, that's it. So we have a song or something at the end. What do we do? Pray? All right, let's pray. Oh yeah, it is eight o'clock. Father, we come to you, and each of us, Lord, we've got our own things to confess. Um, I know for me, I look back over my life, and there are so many times where I've been angry for all different reasons. A lot of times it's because I misperceive something as evil, and it's really not. Or maybe it is, but I overreact, um, and my reaction to it isn't godly. Um, and I just pray for all of us, Lord, that you would give us, you would search our hearts um, try our hearts, try our thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in us, because sometimes we don't even see it, because our hearts can be real deceitful, especially when it comes to something like this. And so would you just allow your word to shine its light into our hearts and reveal the things in our heart that lead us to anger? Um, we repent of blaming other people or situations for our anger. We repent of thinking that anger is something that's apart from us, it just overtakes us. It's not, it's something that we do. We repent of leaping 
to assume the worst about people, when you tell us clear as a bell that we're to assume and, and hope for the best when we love people, all these things that we do wrong, we repent and we ask that you would give us the grace to turn around and walk the other direction and start living our lives in a more Christ-like way. Please give us the the grace to just acknowledge the fact, Jesus, that you're with us. You're, you're, you never leave us or forsake us. You're there all the time. You're there with us in the car when people cut us off in traffic. You're there when we're having an argument with our spouse. You're there when somebody treats us wrong, when somebody talks bad about us, wh whatever. You're always there. And may our responses reflect the fact that you never leave us or forsake us. And we know this is possible. Because you tell us to do it, and you don't go around telling people to do things that are impossible. Impossible for our flesh, yeah, but with Christ, all things are possible. And so thank you that we can do all things, Jesus, through you. And so that's what we ask. We really want to be your ambassadors. And ambassadors of the living, loving God don't go around getting angry at people. Um, at least unrighteously angry. And so, God, would you just use these next few weeks to reveal to us who we are and just allow us to excise that out or let you excise it out of our lives so we have the character of Christ. And we pray this, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, by whom it's all possible. Amen. All right, see you next week.